Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 2023 Incubator EDU of Sheboygan County Final Pitch. Uh, tonight we'll showcase four student setups that have worked the entire school year to ideate, create, craft, reiterate, validate, basically any kind of eight that I could come up with, a business startup. It is an experience unlike anything else that they experience in school, and tonight is the culmination of their hard work. The Incubator EDU experience is broken into eight units in two phases. The first phase, the top row, is the developing of an idea and the developing of a business model around that idea. Students evolve into entrepreneurs by finding a problem to solve and then creating their first version of what they believe that problem can solve. Then they begin a considerable amount of time in learning about their target audience and the validating their assumptions through primary and secondary market research. In the second half of the year, the validation continues, but we move more towards a minimum viable product, which is a low-cost version of their experiment that can illustrate the validity of their model. It will further validate if their initial, initial assumptions were correct while letting them also explore the marketing tactics for acquiring early adopters and also acquiring a customer base. During these units, they will also focus on business finance and the legal aspects of owning and operating their business. It's a pretty big undertaking that uh, I myself have a hard time doing by myself, and I could certainly not do it alone. Business professionals from throughout Wisconsin volunteer their time as coaches, mentors, and surrounding the sounding boards throughout the year. In my opinion, I believe Incubator is the perfect partnership between community and classroom. Tonight's host for Final Pitch is Mei Zhang. Mei and her family have recently opened Best Tea, which is a boba tea cafe in Sheboygan. She is the ideal host for us as she has just recently experienced the startup process and has strong connections to South High as well as both an alumnus and a parent of current Red Wings. So let me please welcome Mei Zhang. My name is Mei Zhang. My family and I just recently, oh, sorry about that, um, reopened um, Bestie, which is a bubble tea cafe located in Sheboygan. Um, some of you guys may know what it is, um, but bubble tea is um, originated from um, Taiwan and it's trending right now due to a lot of the social media and everybody's really into it due to the aesthetics. Um, fun facts about Best Tea is Best Tea was inspired by Cha Bubble Tea in Oklahoma. Um, my family, um, we love to try bubble tea everywhere we go. So we um, decided that we we're going to start selling bubble tea. Uh, but this Best Tea came, came out in 2020 and it was known as Nina's Bubble Tea sh uh, Shop. So we kind of did, it was a um, pandemic, so we had curbside pickup at our house. Um, and it got pretty popular. Um, Lena, which is my sister-in-law, she is a mastermind behind the business. Um, also crafted every drink on the menu. And all bestie employees are family members. So when when we first started um, Bestie, we experienced a few setbacks. Um, we didn't know whether we are going to go with a food truck or if we are going to go with, you know, an actual building. Um, we did have some setbacks, but we overcame those, um, so it's the comeback that matters. Um, adaptability is very important, and we learned that it's the key to success. Um, and marketing is so important. Um, we became popular due to the word of mouth, starting, like I said, in this pandemic in 2020, to curbside that pick up. I don't even know what we were about, and when we came for children, being to Bestie, um, everybody knew where we were, and then they were just, you know, sharing the word. Um, we've realized that major of the target audience, audience through social media platforms is also really, really important. We um, had customers come in and say, hey, we started TikToks, and, you know, we wanted to try you guys out. So that um, helped a lot, and... Um, attracting new customers through promoting and special offers and discounts is also very important. Um, 
So, so I am going to uh, talk about the the procedures for the uh, final pitch here. Um, first, is each startup will be given up to 12 minutes to pitch their idea. Um, after each pitch, the um, incubator board will have five minutes to ask questions. Only board members can ask questions. Once all the pitches have been given, the board will convene and determine incubator EDU winners. Now I'm going to choose the, uh, the board for today. Bob Fitzgerald is the Vice President International Business at Jacksonville. Uh, his responsibilities include coaching business teams in Canada, Mexico, Japan, Korea, and China. Before joining Jacksonville, he gained business experience working with Campbell Soup, General Mills, and Anheuser-Busch. And I also work really closely with um, Bob since I work with international business. Um, Don, Don Hammond, Don is an Executive Vice President, Certified Financial Planner at M Squared Advisory Group, where he works with clients in areas of financial estate and investment planning. He is also a member of MSG's Investment Committee, which focuses on creating management strategies and portfolio management. In the community, he serves as a Chair of Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation, Board member of RCS Empowers Development Board and the UW Sheboygan Foundation. Rick Lundsman? Rick's running late. Oh, okay. Luke doesn't work. <laughs> okay. He'll still have a chance to talk in about half of the week or so. Okay, so I'll just go to Jason. Rick is the Senior Director of Growth at Uncharted Learning, the company behind Incubator. Um, EDU, where he works with schools and districts to expand entrepreneurial education across the country. Rick has spent his career in sales and marketing leadership for a variety of businesses that serve schools, most recently social studies publisher ABC, CLIO, and before that with Encyclopedia Britannica. He lives in Chicago with his wife, two daughters, and his genius dog named Joe. Mandy Chan. <laughs> Mandy is principal attorney and owner of the series Patent and Technology LLC, a boutique law firm specializing in the area of patent and intellectual, intellectual property law and related transactional matters. Ms. Trans practiced in space in Sheboygan County while serving clients throughout the county, oh sorry, in Sheboygan County while serving clients throughout the country and internationally. Her curriculum, curriculum vitae includes studies in the field of biology, forestry, and law publishers in these realms. Ms. Tran grew up in Southern California, traveled and lived in Eastern and Southern parts of the U.S., and has since set her roots in Wisconsin, where she raises her family and her business. So let's hear some business pitches. AI is providing tools to help users reach their maximum potential. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tyler. And I'm Gordon. And we are littleforest.ai. So imagine after a long day of work, you finally get home, and there's a huge stack of dishes and schoolwork to do since you're a part time student. But instead of doing this work, you revert to sitting on the couch, opening up Facebook, and you begin scrolling for hours. You have just fallen into the trap. You find it difficult to manage your time. And you can probably relate to this yourself. More than 84% of people struggle with the same problem. Me personally, I remember my freshman year, I used to sit at my desk late at night, every night, doing AP world work. But in fact, what I was actually doing is a switching through a little bit of schoolwork, social media, and a lot of games. And in the end, I ended up wasting huge voids of time, which cost me my sleep and my contentment. Corbin has a very similar story. My freshman year, I fell into that trap. Weeks of schoolwork piled up, and as soon as I tried to confront it, 
I fell right back into my old habits. I know if I had the, our solution, that those two years of that chaos would have been solved. So what is our solution? Our solution is a gamified habit trap now. Why? Because it's, it's convenient, it's effective, and it's fun. We separated our solution into three different parts. On the top is your little forest, where you put all your progress, and you can share your progress with your friends. In the middle are your habits and your tasks section. This is where you earn the currency to build your little forest. In your pending section are stuff like your calendar tasks. You need to say you have a wedding two weeks out, and you need to bring the right gift. So you can put that in that, you can put in that reminder, and it'll keep it for you. In our solution is also an AI feature, which acts as an all-purpose mentor. We are competing against other habit and gamified habit tracking apps, but our three biggest specific competitors are Habitica, Habit Forest, and Forest App, which all three have seen a great success in. Habitica is another gamified habit tracking app that has one million downloads, and their strongest feature is their customization and their RPG game style, which they walk their users through. However, it's evident through their one-star reviews that it comes at the expense of complexity. Secondly, we have Forest App with 10 million downloads. Forest App is extremely similar to us in our reward system structure, but the thing that differentiates us, thank you, differentiates us is they use a completely different time management tool than we do. What they opt for is, stu is productive study sessions in which users can grow virtual trees on their garden. And what we do is a long-term habit tracking app. And lastly, we have Habit Forest. Habit Forest is the most competitive to us of, um, at all because they are both similar to us in format and functionality. So we've made it clear that we're gonna be better than them because we emphasize our differences. That sounds like a tough competition. So what makes us different? We separated that into four distinct categories. Our simplicity, our gamification, our AI, and the ability to connect with friends. Simplicity is key. We reviewed our competitors' reviews, and we found that the complexity of their apps are not what people want. We strive for simplicity and convenience. Our gamification is engaging for our people. Our research has shown that Students who have a gamified routine are more motivated, they have better academic performance, and it's more engaging. AI is a new techno technological tool, and we plan to use the power of AI and incorporate it into our app so as to give our customers and our users the best experience. And lastly, connecting with friends. Our interviews have shown that connecting with your friends makes it more enjoyable and Sharing your progress gives a sense of connection. We know that you have the ability to connect with friends, but who are we targeting? So as for who we're targeting, assuming that they have access to cell phones, we are targeting high school and college students aged 15 to 25 that struggle with time management. Why? Because they need it the most, and this age demographic is best suited for new technologies and especially AI. And that brings up the question, how many of these people are we going to be addressing? Our total addressable market is huge and it sits at 140 million people that are under the age of 40, reside in the United States, and have access to a cell phone or computer. To note, our TAM revenue sits at $3.4 billion, and our more realistic market is our SAM, which sits at 6.1 million people and $147 million. This was further derived from our SAM, and it includes the personal development market and takes into account the 13% of people that can manage their time well already. And now for our MVP. Our MVP was itself a Google slide presentation that people would walk through in order to understand our app. At first, we had a website that people would go onto, and they would click a, a placeholder buy button to show their support. 
We strive to get 60 percent. At first, we strive to get 64 percent of our viewers to click on that placeholder buy button. But after revisions, we decided that Instagram was the best way to go. So we merged all our stuff there and planned to get people to click on a new metric, on a new MVP, which was our mailing like list that they'd go through on our posts with the various call to actions. Our new metric was 90 people total to sign up. And of that, we had 23 total. So what went wrong with our MVP? We turned inconsistent posts with not with call to actions in not the right place and the posts themselves that weren't interesting into vibrant, more regular posts that got people's attention better. Now let's get into our financials. Regarding our years one to three net profits and losses, at year one, we're gonna be at about a 49,000 net loss. And this is primarily composed of startup costs and takes into account that we won't have a lot of users now. Year two is our catch up year and we'll be at a net loss of $5,400. And in year three, we're net profiting $88,000. Our revenue streams are divided up, divided up into five different categories. Our in-app purchases are of low tier, the currency that I talked about before. Our ads are at $800 a year, and we plan to keep them off to the side so as to not disrupt the experience. Ad in-app removal is projected to get 30% of our users to pay for the $199 add-on. Our AI subscription, priced at $0.99, cents, is projected to get 35% of our users to pay for that. And lastly is donations, which may sound odd, but we plan to do second, we, we plan to have a secondary mission that supports trees that we'll talk about later for nonprofits. Our expenses are divided into three different categories: our startups, our SGA, and our recruiting position. Our startup is at 53000 and is mainly consisted of app development, which is $45,000 of that, which we took from various studies and picked the best one. Our SGNA is, 30, is $34,000, and that consists of keeping our app relevant and making sure that, sure that there are no bugs. And last is our liquidity cushion, which we took from half of our startup costs. And now here is our plan to net profit by year three. In year one, we are sharp and focused on getting our app and website developed and out there. And this is exactly what we're going to be marketing later on. It's exactly on the App Store because our research points to it. In year two, we're going to branch out to the other social medias, making sure to utilize our shorts method, which has been proven to gain new viewers. We're also going to reach out to social media influencers and affiliate marketing services. And in year three, we should have a structured app going at this point, so it is now time to start formulating specialized teams, like a specialized coding team or marketing team. And alongside this, we plan on partnering with other self-improvement groups. So what does the, the future I mean, of our company look like? Well, after we finish our actual app, the goal is to create the best possible version this app can be, the dream. Achieving the dream of littleforest.ai means that we have successfully created an easy to use, convenient app um, that has completely gamified people's habits, tasks, and reminders so that they can execute with their time as they wish. Motivated to keep going as they grow as individuals, with their friends, with their digital forests, and with the environment around them, which gets into our secondary mission. There is a reason why me and Corbin chose our award system to be a little forest to cultivate. And that's because environmental issues are very near and dear to both of us. And so in the future, we plan to reallocate funds to broken habitats and to fix the environments around the world. We're asking for $2,000 to continue app development with our coder, our head coder, Jesus, back there. We're also asking for that to get laptops to get us to our head started, to secure our domain name, and using the rest of the funds to get our app out there. Thank you for your time. Do you have any questions? I, I really kind of like how you structured that. Um, and I might have a small suggestion to connect two pieces of what you have, but I, I actually have 
part of my the other parts of my questions have to more to do with financials. Um, maybe I should start with that. You discussed the cost of this project being uh, about fifty three thousand capital. I think it was like a few pages prior to this, but I don't remember. I think you were just moving so quickly through it. But did you have in there a cost estimated for annual long term maintenance? Because I suspect that this is going to continue to evolve, and you're, you're probably going to continue to tweak it and improve on it. Yes, in our SGNA, we have allocated eighteen thousand dollars to make sure that our cap is relevant, is bug free. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and then also probably just to continue to evolve it in terms yeah. of giving it features that feed into the marketing side. Yeah. I mean, we we took nine thousand of that to dedicate to making sure that that. I like the fact that your um, trans. I guess the word is um. Translating, I, I, I like the fact that you're you're utilizing people's efforts and then contributing it to something tangible, growing trees. And I wonder if maybe um, some of this, the, the the users, they're being reported virtually. But I, do you have any thoughts of maybe having their work uh, count towards? Your financial contribution, so that way they also see a tangible effect of, of what their you know their own productivity has more of a global effect that way too. Yeah. So the tree growing thing, our secondary mission is more of a future thing, but we have thought about that a little bit. If you're familiar with the app browser Ecosia, it's like for every number of searches they will plant a tree. We want to do something similar with that. Um, we probably won't have this system set up until we have like a good app going and running. And this will be when all the in-app ads are gone because we want to remove those ASAP and just, we need revenue to get going. And when users are able to pick which tree they wish, they wish to plant on their virtual island, there'll be a total count of how many trees they've actually planted in the future. And as well as the entirety of the app. So maybe six million trees throughout the entire app, and they've contributed 14. Yeah. Great, thanks guys. Uh, great presentation. Clearly you did a lot of work. I have a couple of questions. Um, the first question is on the AI element. That's new, I, we didn't see that before. Can you say a little bit more about the AI element and what does that bring to the the app and the value proposition? Yes. Technology has advanced enough to, to where we have really powerful language models that have so much data sets that they search through and come up with information. And it's come to the point where you can include it in different businesses and app developments. And so we're planning to include that so that people, if somebody has a question on how to fix a car and a certain thing about it, they'll be able to ask the, the AI, how, how can I fix the car in a certain way? And they'll be given the guidance that they need. Cool. Um, and then, second question is on your TAM and your SAM. Your SAM seemed still very large. Can you just talk a little bit about how, what was your math to get from your TAM and your SAM? So, I'll start with our TAM. We started with the entirety of the US population, and we further it down to people under the age of 40 that had cell phones. And we took into account the people that could manage their time already, so they're not in the equation. Um, sorry, that last one was part of the SAM. Okay. The secondary refiner for our SAM was it took into account the personal development market, which I believe is about 0.7. So that was the um, further driver of our SAM. Okay. So our TAMP had about four metrics, and our SAM had about two refining metrics. Nice job, guys. Um, it's not easy getting up there, so great job. A couple of questions um, on the number side of things. Um, on the SGNA, um, I didn't see any, or maybe you mentioned it, um, but employees. Um, how, how do you, especially as you scale this up, and you mentioned a couple adding some positions here and there, but in that 34,000, how are you guys going to get paid? In the first three years, we don't plan to pay ourselves because we want to focus on app development. 
Coming year three, we'll, we'll incorporate that, but our SGA as, as of now is, is just for those years one to three. And that includes the development cost of the, yes. of the application. Um, Jesus works for cheap. <laughs> yeah, so far. <laughs> um, so um, the other question I had is on the marketing side, going through the socials, you mentioned that you were you know, going to incorporate the socials in year two and not right off the bat. Explain to me why you wait a year to um, use socials to your benefit, even if you're just, again, uh, kind of bootstrapping it. Well, we found that Instagram is like the best place to start for us, just based on our target audience. So we want to cultivate a big following there first, while we work on the app um, on the side. I mean, we could do a bunch of them. We could do TikTok and Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat all at the same time. But I think putting more marbles into where the biggest concentration of our target audience is would be more ideal in the beginning. We could see. Um, He's asking if we're, if we're going to start our, our, our social media year two. We're going to start in year one. We're just going to branch out year two. Branch out to things like Snapchat, TikTok, and things like that. Yeah. And last, just on the pricing, can you walk through that again? Um, yeah. So um, you were talking about $1.99 and then a $0.99. Cent. Yes. Um, can you just maybe briefly just recap so, that again? The, Yes, it was. Oh yeah. <laughs> Thank you. For our AI subscription, it's priced at ninety nine cents because as of right now, AI is fairly cheap, so we don't want to overprice it so that people aren't aren't using it because we want to incorporate that as one of the main features. But we also need to make a profit from it. And our ad removal that is that is priced at one ninety nine. 30% 30, 30 of people will not project to get that. But as soon as as soon as soon it's gone, it's evaporating once ads are, my ads are evaporating as well, then we're going to transfer that into other sources of revenue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next team is simply delicious, baking them right, filling the desire for treats for individuals with dietary restrictions. Hello, I'm Emilio. I'm Emilio. And we are simply delicious, baking them right. This all starts with a friend of mine. His name is Dominic. He is allergic to peanuts and coconuts. Or peanuts, apologies. Uh, we went to Blue Harbor a Resort in Sheboygan, and he ordered pina colada, drinking it unknowing that there was coconut in it. He had an allergic reaction, and his dad had to uh, his dad had to bring his second test. He ended up okay, but it ruined the rest of our plans for the day. Can I get a show of hands in here of who has allergies or knows someone who has allergies? If you guys look around, there's plenty of people with hands up, so we figured this is probably a popular problem. We interviewed four four individuals asking them if they had allergies and if they were if it was, if it was convenient for them. And they said no, which was a problem that we saw that it was accessible, and when it was, it was out of the budget. Our solution is our solution is having a mobile bakery around Chihuahua County selling allergy-friendly baked goods. We chose this solution because I personally, I personally love baking and I'm going to pursue it as a career, so this was a pretty good solution for us today. This is a mock design of our <coughs> mobile bakery, which we will be selling and making. The product. Our, yeah. So our competitors ranges through bakeries, um, online retail sellers, and food trucks. For our first competitor, which is a bakery, the price ranges three dollars to twenty-eight dollars. Pick up and delivery with the listed allergy friendly. When you you have to call to make a special request to make it the item allergy friendly, or for example, gluten. For enjoying life better, 
the price range is five dollars to twenty nine dollars, which is in, sold in big brand, big brand stores such as Walmart. But portion size is very small; it doesn't satisfy the individual. For sweetie sweets, the price range is one dollar to seven dollars, which is pick up and delivery, which is gluten and baby free, but only on certain items, for example, such as cookies or brownies. For flipping donuts, the price range is two dollars to twenty-two dollars, which is pick up and catering, pick up and catering, and has no allergy friendly. We compared our current market, which is a bakery and a food truck. We saw that a bakery was stationary, limited on allergy friendly options, and also, but we saw in affordable items, which we saw as a benefit. We saw a food truck, which was mobile, but it limited on allergy friendly options, but when there was, the price was out of the budget. So, we want to provide convenience and wellness to the person. So our solution was is becoming mobile, having other friendly options, and also an affordable item. Affordable items, making it fresh. This is our we are trading Customers that have their income of forty thousand or higher, also little kids, because a survey conducted by the CDC, one out of four kids have allergies. Targeting also individuals that have four main allergies, such as dairy, gluten, egg, and nut, and morning people, because bakeries are normally open during the morning. For the U.S., for the camp, we have six million people who would be interested, with our revenue being two, 22 billion. For Sam, for in Wisconsin, it would be one million, with our revenue being four billion. And we got these revenue projections by assuming one person would buy every other day for five years. Our marketing plans for launch include face-to-face -face marketing. Uh, we plan to go to Walrath Parks for every Monday and Wednesday for a local food truck event that happens each morning, as well as driving up to churches, farmers markets, and festivals, selling to the people, getting our product out there in the public. We also plan to seal our products with stickers that have our logo and our Instagram tag on it, as well as handing out business cards and just having a little sign for that that also have our website and Instagram handles. We also plan to use Instagram with paid ads because that is our main social media platform. For our MVP, our goal was to get 25 followers and of the 25, get 10% to meet our website. And when to reach that goal, we decided to go through Beats and Follies and sell products. Um, we decided to sell and make product. We made 74 items and out of the 74, we sold 62. The most popular items were carrot cake and brownies. And we made $176 in revenue, which we put right back into our MVP, just so that we would have more product to make it sell. And from this MVP, we did learn that selling product to people, getting out there and actually talking to them about what we're doing, gets a lot more traffic towards our Instagram and our website. We also learned what products we would sell more of. We thought we would sell more cookies, but we sold a lot more carrot cake, and cookies were one of the least favorite items. Um, and for the goal, we did get 14 new followers, and of the 14, 2% went to the website and stayed for two to three minutes. You can see here that this is our cost of goods. So for the cookies, for the cookies and brownies, we're planning on making them for a dollar and seven cents, selling it for two dollars with a with a gross margin of 49%. And then we plan on selling banana bread, making it for $1.81, and then selling it for $3.50 with a gross margin of 48%. We do plan on selling coffee as well, because we're going to be uh, going to churches in the morning, which is a 20 ounce coffee 
and the cost of goods does factor in two free sugar packets and two free creamers, which comes to 24 cents to make it, and then we're going to be selling it for 475, which brings the gross margin to 95 percent. And then for the carrot cake, our most popular item, we would be making it. We would be making it at 278, selling it at six dollars with a gross margin of 54 percent. I'm rounding up. For the first year, we plan on, we project to sell 23,000 units, and then between year one and year two, there would be a 150% growth rate, bringing year two's unit sales to 58,000. Then between year two and year three, would be a 70% growth rate, bringing year three's units to 99,000. These growth rates we looked, we researched our, our competitors and their growth rates within their first years, and these are the numbers that have matched up with theirs. We plan on meeting, meeting these growth rates from year one and year two to 150% by expanding to other counties and other cities here in Wisconsin and just throughout the state. And then for the 70% growth rate between year two and year three, we plan on expanding with catering and online orders. This is our three-year summary summary net profit for year one that is really the only year we would be losing money and we'd um, be losing 25,000 year two we would be uh, we would have a net income of 33,000 and then for year three we have a net income of 98,000 within the first few years if we don't meet these numbers we will end up uh, selling because if it doesn't meet the numbers, then we will sell. However, if we do meet the numbers and we project beyond it, we will continue to move on with this business and expand past Wisconsin. This is our SGNA. In our SGNA, the largest cost that you can see here is salaries. Uh, it's at 70000 which incorporates paying two bakers, which would be me and Manuel for the whole year, which is $35,000 each. We got that number by looking up the average salary of a baker. Uh, and then the other prices like the administrative costs account for licensing, food licensing, city permits, selling permits, uh, insurance, any legal fees you might have to cover. And then our initial market, not initial, our marketing costs moving through three years of just like making and selling products and then making stickers and just driving out around. These are our startup costs. Uh, the highest cost that you can see here is our food truck. We would be buying it for $71,000 and then spending $10,000 to renovate and buy any equipment we might need for it. The second highest is again the salaries, just paying me and him for the first year for the average salary of the baker. The second highest cost is again marketing because that's a very important part of getting a business out to the public, making sure that they know, and just going out there and selling. Uh, the next highest is the administration, administrative cost. Again, just buying the rights to our logo and then licensing, food permits, insurance to make sure that we're all covered in those areas. And then the start of inventory just for the first six months would be a thousand, just over a thousand to make that inventory. And we are asking for $2,000 to cover the start of inventory so we can immediately start making and selling the products. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Uh, thanks for that presentation. It's very thorough. I, I really love it. Um, I'm a long way with that too. Um, the, I have some thoughts. I guess, um, you know, you listed your competitors and it's a, a kind of a local production. So it looks like your, at least your current vision for the next few years is more of a local growth with the potential of growing the brand regionally probably for your size and limit, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think that with this type of product, oftentimes, you know, there's the proprietary aspect of it is just in the taste and, and you know, people. So it's, it's hard to, I think it's hard to compete sometimes at that level. And I've noticed in this realm, 
um, especially in foods, I'm sure Bob can speak to, a lot of it is probably in relationships. And I wonder if you have any plans to leverage that, because I've seen like in other types of baked goods type products that will leverage it through like institutions, like you mentioned, in churches. So do you have any plans on growing it in terms of uh, moving a higher production into those areas where you might sell wholesale or at discount rates in larger bunches because you are affordable, so you do have the ability to kind of meet that type of, tap into that demand more. And if so, then I didn't see if there may be also a commercial kitchen or something like that that you would need for that. So it's a big question. But. That question often comes up uh, whenever we do our kitchens, like are, you, are we going to use a commercial kitchen and then just deliver out? Uh, right now, we're starting with a food truck because I love just like making food and giving it out to people and like mass producing it into something I'm quite looking forward to. But I know that eventually, if this gets big enough, that will have to happen. So, yes, we would get a commercial kitchen and then just like a delivery van to just drive out and uh, bring out orders to wherever. So, yeah, that is our plan. Yes, great. Thank you for doing that. Uh, and every time I see your pitch, I want to get into the coffee business. Jeez. Uh, <laughs> um, what is the, when you did your MVP, and that was a really great MVP, by the way, what was your allergen that you were solving for um, with all, the, all four items? Oh, uh, so we were gluten free, nut free, dairy free, and egg free. So all four we did. All four. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's great. Um, the second question is, have you done the math between your 23,000 units in year one and how many servings that would be per hour, per window, per stop? We did not do that. Okay. I think, we, I think you may want to check that. That could be, uh, but other, otherwise, great. Excellent. And great progress over the last couple of months, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Nicely done. Um, I'm just going to piggyback on his a tad bit. Um, both of you guys are employees. Um, I love that you built in salaries for yourself. Um, a lot of times that doesn't happen. and um, So you built it. But um, I'm assuming the baking piece is a fairly time consuming process. I'm just curious of how you guys plan to bake and operate the food truck. You know, be out where you're actually selling the product. Are you looking to eventually hire somebody to do that? How would you do that initially? Um, so on and so forth. So initially, what we have like regular bakeries, their bakers come in at like five or four or five in the morning, get as much product that they're selling that day, and then just sell it when they're out. They're out. Uh, we will do that at the very beginning until like for the first year that's what we would do and then for the second year we have calculated in our financial model paying another person like a third person coming in and then again fourth we have looked into expanding that way uh, and that is probably what we do depending on how quickly it grows we would get an, a commercial kitchen probably almost like in accordance to how much we're going to grow and then maybe a little bit of a follow-up to Mandy's question, but you know, kind of a unique product. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, with the whole foods of the world, and it's, that's a tough industry, as, as Bob knows, you know, getting placement on shelves and things like that. But um, being that this is unique, have you thought about or talked amongst yourselves about, you know, store placements or licensing agreements where you could you know, get this out to the masses a little bit? You know, scale it up a little bit. I don't think that we've looked into that. Not like, like not mass producing it at all. We just more of like the, like the home cooked bakery kind of style. Okay. Thank you. Great job, guys. Um, next, we are going to be taking a pitch break here. I'm, I'm Rick Lumsden. I'm from Uncharted Learning, the 
makers of Incubator EDU. Um, and Greg asked me to just say a few words about our program during this, this short break. So I have a question for the adults in this room. How many of you had a class like this in high school? Right? No hands go up. That's probably the feedback we get more often than not from, uh, from adults who see what students can do when they're put at the center of their own learning. They say, wow, I wish I had a class like this in high school. And that's actually the kind of the origin of our company, uh, of our nonprofit. Um, two, two dads in a local community outside Chicago were frustrated with what they saw going on in business education and thought, what would happen if we gave students a more authentic experience? And tonight, right while this is going on here, there's a pitch going on in that local high school for the 10th time. So we've been around 10 years. We're in over, uh, we're in 24 states. We just picked up another state recently uh, and growing. We have programs for fifth grade through, through high school. Um, but with all of our programs, the really the key thing is, is being authentic, uh, giving students a, a real experience with entrepreneurship. And such an important part of that is all of you being here. The mentors, the coaches, the community support, that's what really brings it to life. So I want to thank all of you for supporting the, the program uh, here in Sheboygan. Thank you. The next group is called Keep Safe. Helping drivers avoid stress and loss that comes with all the ratings. Hello, my name is Jacob Whiting, and I am the founder of Keepsakes. So Keepsakes was started with the goal of solving the problem of car break-ins. Seven. This may seem like a really insignificant and random number to you guys, but it's actually a lot more relevant than you realize. This is the number of cars in the parking lot as we speak that are left unlocked and unguarded from potential thieves. Originally, to solve this problem, I wanted to create a fully and customizable window tip that you can change the darkness up to whatever you wanted. I realized this was going to be very expensive for both the producers and the consumer, so I pivoted and wanted to toggle window tips on and off. Through research and validation, I found this county in True, True County, County in Georgia, that reported that 90% of their car break-ins were simply because the victims left their doors unlocked. Of the people I personally interviewed, 63% could have prevented their break-ins by simply locking their doors, which is why I created the LockBot. It looks something like the product on the left. You plug in your OB2 port, which is a small port located under your steering wheel of your car, and it'll connect to your car or your phone via Bluetooth and lock your doors for you as you walk away so that you don't forget to lock your doors anymore. It'll connect to the app that was on the right. It's a little closer look. You can see this person has two devices connected. The one on the left, their car is locked, and the one on the right, the car is unlocked. You click that little gear, you can turn on the automatic lock and unlock if you don't want to keep locking on you. Hello, judges and spectators. This is the lock bot. And to install it, first you walk over to your car, open your door, and plug it into the OBD2 port. Once it's in, you take your phone, follow the connection procedures that you'll be walked through on the app, and walk away from the car. As you can see on the app, it is locked, the car locked behind me, and you are all set. Thank you, and back to the pitch. But I put this product in front of other people to ask them some questions. The chart on the bottom, I asked how much safer it would make them feel with this product in their car. Four being much safer, and one being not safe at all. 58% reported this product would make them feel much safer, while 25% said it would still make them feel safer, but not completely safe. Only 16% reported that this product would not make them feel safer when making their car. In the top right in the chart, I asked about a subscription-based feature that I plan to have, remote lock and unlock, so you can lock your car from anywhere via your phone. 70.8% reported they'd be interested in paying and having this feature. Our market, we have two, our total addressable market is 289.5 million. That is the estimated number of cars on the road in the United States. Our surgical addressable market goes down to 231.6 million, which is the estimated number of cars that are 1996 and newer, which guarantees that they have an OB2 port in their car, as that's when they started mandating them to be in all vehicles. Our competition, our two main competition, our major car brands, which I chose Chevy to represent as the biggest in the United States, and this product by base technology that you can see on the right. The product by base technology, in comparison to the LockBot, is $400 compared to $39.99. 
It does have automatic lock and unlock, however, it does not have a remote lock and unlock feature, and you also have to hardware it into your car as opposed to just plugging it in and connecting to a remote to. Chevy has a month or monthly subscription of $14.99 compared to a $39.99 upfront. They do not have an automatic lock and unlock feature, however, they do have a remote lock and unlock feature. The cost of the lockbot contains these five pieces and totals to $7.85. The first piece is the case that plugs into the port. This has the 16 pins and is where all the pieces will be stored to work with your car. The second part is the step down power supply, which takes the 12 volts from the car battery converts it to five volts that the motherboard can use without frying. The third part is then the motherboard. This has the Bluetooth technology to connect your phone, along with telling all the other pieces what to do and when to do it. The fourth part are these GPS chips. We plan to have GPS tracking in them later on as a another subscription. That, that way you can find your car, if you forget where you parked, your car was sold, you can track it down and locate it. And our fifth piece is packaging. This would include boxes and instructions and that type of thing for shipping. Our revenue models, we have two main revenue streams. Our transaction-based revenue, we're going to sell it for $39.99. Our first year, we estimated 355 sales, giving us $14,196. In our second year, we estimated a 69% growth rate, at estimating 50 a month or 600 for the year, giving us $22,992. In our third year, we expected a 300% growth rate, or $2,400 a year in the year, giving us $95,968. Our subscription-based revenue, we used our solution interviews and estimated that 70% people would buy the subscription, and that is where we got those numbers from. Now, to get those growth margins that I talked about, we have a growth plan. In year one, we plan to market mainly on social media, but also in person. In year two, we will continue marketing, along with trying to get our product into local stores and online stores like Amazon. In year three, We'll continue marketing along with trying to get into big box stores like Walmart, AutoZone, and stores like that to sell our product to a larger audience. Our SGNA, our yearly cost, consists of these four parts. Our website slash hosting is $324 a year. Our accounting for managing our money is $2,500. And our marketing, we plan to allocate $2,000 a year to get our product out to people, along with a salary, which will be 10% of our revenue that will be paid to people that are working on the project. Our net income in year one will be $4,300. In year two, it'll be $18,754. And in year three, $81,729. Our starting costs consist of these five. Our patents, we plan to have a functionality patent to protect the coding and the process in which the lockout works. Our trademarks, we need two trademarks, one for our logo and one for our name. Our product app development is actually zero dollars. A member of our team, my father, has actually been product, or produced or developing the app and product for free. Our marketing, we plan to allocate five hundred dollars prior to launch to market and get our product out there. And our startup inventory of one hundred twenty-seven units is nine hundred ninety-six dollars and ninety-five cents. Now, I just want to take a moment to thank the team that's been working on this product. Me on the left, my mentor Dustin in the middle, and my dad. Larry on the right. <laughs> <laughs> so now I want to demo the product. Uh, we do have a great prototype here, but I want to start off with a video kind of explaining it. So you can see there's a box, you plug it in on the right side. Once it's plugged in, you go to the app, you hit install. It's installed in the box, so you hit install. You wait for the pop up there, you hit the drop down, and you hit connect. And then you get to name it. For the sake of the demo, I named it demo. And then you scroll down, you pick the distance you want, and you hit continue. Then you hit finish, wait for it to load, and then you will see the product will pop up right there. And then as you walk away with the phone, you can see on that little screen right there, it says locked, car secure. And when I make it back, you can see on the phone, the product is locked, as you can see there. So now I want to take a moment to do this in person. So we'll start right here. We'll plug this in. Make sure this little red light comes on. And we'll open the app. Does anyone want to actually do it? So you hit the little three lines up, up there. Oh, no. Keep the little three lines. Hit install. Hit install. 
as you can see, so you hit install. Click on the little drop down, scroll down to connect, name it whatever you want. And you can pick the distance so you can keep it at the default. Okay. And you hit F and you hit finish. And now you can see the product there. And if you actually want to walk away with the phone, you will see a lock on the screen, and for you guys here, it'll say lock right on this little take a picture of the water. Okay, you just want to start walking. All right. Is it locked? And there it is. I know. So that is working prototype. This is actually the second version of our prototype. It's not currently working. This is a better idea of what it'll look like compared to just loose wires. So you guys aren't the only person, people that have seen this. I put this in front of some other people, and here's some of the feedback we got. People are asking if I need investors, saying it's an awesome idea, telling me to take their money. People are <laughs> very excited about the product, saying it is a market disruption, very cool concept. People are just really excited. So that is why I'm asking for $1,000 so I can purchase my startup inventory, 127 units, and start selling to the public as soon as I possibly can. Thank you. Are there any questions? Super awesome product, project and product. Um, it's like the science fair that I needed this year. <laughs> um, this is really tech focused, yeah. right? And so um, you talk about patents. I think that was really wise of you to identify that. Um, what I run into situations like this is where you have, you have proprietary information both in terms of the technology and how it works, the functionality, as well as in the software that's written in copyright. And uh, some questions I have, it boils down to, is it protectable you know, in either realms? And if it's not, then, then you may be subject to basically a watershed of competitors from anywhere. You know? yeah. And so in either, in either uh, paradigms, I guess, uh, situations, you, you're going to be faced with some form of enforcement over time. Um, and I guess in terms of vetting out that the enforceability, and that might actually uh, affect your business model. So I don't, I, I think here in this presentation, you're presuming that it's protectable. In my head, I'm just thinking like with the software that was written, you know, are you using open source? Know, technology there um, is is the copyright is it copyrightable in particular in that realm and uh, in patents you know can you lock it down or are there other technology you're using that might require you to license as well and is this patented too so I think that at least in my head as in, as someone who would be potentially investing I want to know where the technology stands in that way. Um, and so I guess that's my question to you, to you is like, have you considered that and how it's going to affect your business model? If it slice, slices one way or the other. Yeah, so I have considered that. It is patentable technology. You can patent the um, actual coding itself, so people can't copy it and put it into their own product. So yeah, it is patentable. Wow, great. Um, can you talk a little bit about your supply chain? So it sounds like a lot of manufacturing. It sounds like uh, could take a long time to manufacture and then get it into your distribution network. Can you talk a little bit about where you plan to have these produced? Yeah, so right now I'm planning on actually just ordering the parts and putting them together at home. Uh, later down the line, I do want to eventually have them manufactured somewhere else and then have them shipped over. But for now, I do plan to put them together at home. Uh, all right, and then uh, from your sales channel, are you, the plan was to start online at first via social media and then move into brick and mortar? Yeah, so we'd be selling them on our website and shipping them to the customers and reaching out to our customers via social media. And down the line, we try and get into in person stores, which is when we go to stores and buy them in person. Nice job. Um, videos, I like that one. Uh, we can have a yeah, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, so, the subscription model here is 
in order to open and close your door or your car remotely, correct? Yeah, from, yeah. Okay. Right. Um, what traction do you think you're going to get with with that? And the only reason I ask is uh, the vehicle I have, um, the Ford, it's not a plug for Ford. And Ford has an app that I can open, start my vehicle, open and close doors. You know, and I feel like cars, most vehicles going forward are going to have that. I know that's not the total market, but you can just talk to that a little bit. Um, is that, are you going to become obsolete over time because of the technology of the big car manufacturers? So yeah, there still are a lot of cars that don't have that. A lot of them are trying to bring it in, but I know a lot of the big brands will actually like give you the feature and then take it away and they can start paying for it after a year or two. So we are providing this more of a cheaper option for some of the newer cars and an option for the older cars that don't have the feature. And then, in my mind, when it goes to technology, um, goes to you know helping somebody use this against or use it in a negative way. Um, what protections would be part of the software to make sure that you know, it doesn't get hacked and something get into your car, or especially with the GPS feature that they can be you know followed or tracked or whatever the case may be. Yeah. So once you have it connected to your phone and your app, it won't connect to any other app or any other phones or devices. So it'll stop people from just going and connecting to it on their own device. And the GPS will only ping to our servers and so that they can then ping to only your device. And then last, um, and again, we see this quite often each each year um, when we look at the SG&A expenses. Um, you mentioned the county, for example, 2,500. Um, being a recovering accountant, that uh, probably may need to be adjusted a little bit. Um, some of those expenses, like has to be County marketing, uh, just website development alone um, is going to be you know, far more unless you can find somebody to do that um, for free or for a lower cost. But those just made me be revisited. I think you have a fantastic you know, idea here and a fantastic prototype. And just re looking at those models might be, uh, might be helpful. All right. So I, I'm curious to know more about the market need and market awareness. We, we, we mentioned a sh one sheriff's office had some pretty compelling statistics about unlocked car doors, but how do you, how do you, how are you going to get the, the market to see that as a, as a compelling thing? So I think a lot of my advertising will focus heavily on the problem of unlocked cars and car break-ins and the large numbers of car break-ins, but I think market's obviously there, so I think it's very reachable. Do you have a sense of how big the market is for other like aftermarket products that people might use to uh, protect their cars? No, I'm not sure. It might be interesting to see. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
is that with skin complications, it's difficult to find products and tapes that are gentle for the skin and also affordable. When I started my journey, I had conducted some home interviews, and I found three common concerns. The first one being that people were concerned that their skins were going to break out after using the product. The second one being that morning and skincare routines doing makeup would take a lot of time. And the last one being that cosmetic products today were too expensive. For example, a simple eyeshadow powder can cost well over $50. Which brings me to my new routine. I would like to promote that my products would be multi-use, which means that they would function as more than just one thing, which would cut these makeup, morning, skincare routines in half. Then that they're skincare based. I would like to say that skincare based means that it would work well with skin rather than work against it like normal aspect products do. And lastly, that they're affordable. If there's nothing harder than finding a product that you like and then it costs $50. After consulting with Dr. Mark Canavo, MD, who was a dermatologist for over 40 years, I addressed my problems and concerns with him, and he reviewed my ingredients and found that these would be beneficial for the skin. He also saw the need at a potential market. A quote from here states that there is a direct need for these kinds of products for teenagers, which is why my target market would consist of teenagers ages 12 to 18 who have sensitive skin and use makeup and skincare. I would like to narrow my market a little more by saying that I think my products would be best for those who are new to makeup or have little to no experience. My first product that I'm currently developing is a multi-use stick, which would be a blush and lip combo priced at $13. In my first year of sales, assuming that I make over 900 in sales, I would make a revenue of $12,000. With a 3.8% growth rate, by my third year, I'd be making $13,000 in revenue. This is subject to change, however, because I plan on creating and adding more products to my line, such as a lip oil priced at $9 and a hydrating stick priced at $15. In my first year of selling these three products, my, growth, my total revenue would be at $34,000. My target market, or my target population, TAM, would consist of women in the U.S. ages 12 to 18 who use makeup and skincare. This leaves me with just under 4 million people. Then my SAM would be of those who have sensitive skin, leaving me with 1,400,000 people. After doing some MVP experimentation, I come quickly to realize that it was going to be a lot harder to make cosmetic products than I thought it was going to be. One of the biggest roadblocks that I experienced was mixing the ingredients together and finding that water-based ingredients and oil-based ingredients don't mix well. To improve from this, I would like to take more time to assure that my products are safe and that they work perfectly just the way that I would like them to. The cost of this sold for my product that I'm currently working on would be 89 cents, and I'll, which gives me a 93.15% growth margin. And although this may seem like a large growth margin, in the cosmetics industry, 80 to 90% growth margins are very common. My SGNA would, my startup cost would be at $2,800, and although that state may seem very low, I would have to worry about things like location, electricity, because I plan on making my products at home. Then my SGA would just be over $600 or $6,000. After doing some competitor analysis, I have two competitors that I find very similar to my brand that I'm mentioning here today. The first one being Olive a local brand here in Sheboygan that promotes that their products are healing, versatile, and not common. Their product that is most similar to mine would be their tinted chapstick. However, I would like to point out that their products are more skincare based than cosmetic based. Then I have Axiology, a brand here in the US that promotes that they are animal cruelty free, fully vegan, and clean. The product that they have that's most similar to mine would be their 3 in 1 balm. 
but their products are more cosmetic based than skincare based, which is why I would like to point out that the skincare based cosmetics industry in itself is a relatively untouched industry. Things that you'd find in this industry would be tinted lotions, scented chapsticks, or lip tints, but it's a very small category of products that can be used. My marketing would consist mainly of around social media. Things like Instagram ads and paid promotions are what I've done a lot of my marketing money on. And I would run campaigns like this around main times in teenagers' lives, such as the beginning of the new year, the beginning of summer, the beginning of the school year, and Christmas time. But aside from just social media, I would like to point out that I plan on attending two beauty conferences per year, <coughs> and I would get more physical things like business cards and stickers, and also be handing out free samples at those beauty conferences to get something physical in front of possible customers. Future plans for my business were to implement a refill program to promote sustainability. A refill program is essentially a program where a customer could send back an empty product container and I could refill it and send it back to them for a discounted price. Then, to become 100% sustainable. I would hope that one day my brand would become 100% sustainable, meaning that we would use no plastic and all of our packaging would be either reusable or recycled. And lastly, inclusivity. As a person of color, I would be, like to see more brands today be more inclusive with everybody so that everyone can be available using my products. An exit plan would be to sell my product recipes to a strategic buyer after three years of selling the product if I were unsuccessful. And I ask for the $1,000 today for research and development purposes. Thank you. I welcome any suggestions or insight. Thank you for your presentation. It's really good. Um, I appreciate uh, you, your identification and sort of the key features that, you know, uh, the MVP of, of your product. I agree that um, the multi-use aspect of it and the skincare focus is the way to go. I have two teenagers, young girls, so totally in that world right now, and I understand how this is relevant to them. Um, you speak about your uh, SGA, and you're going to start off sort of with a smaller ask, and you're going to hand produce a lot of this at the beginning stage. And I think in this world, what I've seen is that it, it, you, you're either going to be sort of on the smaller end of the smaller scale of production and entry into the market, or else you're super big. It's kind of, there's not much in the middle, especially if you are, have a, if you and network your way into like social media, you know, there's gonna be an increase in demand. So I guess my question is more to do with your vision because um, there's going to be a certain time frame that you probably want to aim to go from one you know, scale to another. And what's your, your vision for scaling up and where do you want it to be you know, in terms of over a course of maybe three to five year time frame? Yeah, so by my five year time frame that I would have, I would hope to be selling products, um, at least in the US, and since everything I would be selling would be online, that would be pretty tangible. And I, I guess that's my answer to your question is I hope by my fifth year I would be selling products at least um, nationwide. This is great. Uh, yeah, I, love, I love that you clearly connected your passion, your personal passion to your business. I, I think that's really wonderful. Um, question about production and your, your value chain. So my understanding is you haven't made a product yet, you have a recipe, have you made a full viable product yet? Um, not yet, because I would like to test how safe my product would be and the difficulties of creating a product was um, different from what I expected it to be. Got it. And so that would be one of my questions. Your first year with 900 units, um, how long does making 900 units take at home? Is that a big batch? Do you just help paint the picture on how, how you make the product? Yeah, so my first 
couple of months of selling, I would be getting, I would be getting a few socks per month. So rather than making a big batch, it would be a lot of small batches of coffee being made. Um, kind of piggybacking off of Bob's question um, on the MVP. So you weren't able to make anything or create the product, but you know what? What feedback did you get? Um, you know, from an MVP standpoint on this product. So I personally was experimenting and I was making product that just wasn't successful for myself, and I think that the kind of feedback that I could have received from other people would have been valuable, but I didn't want to put their safety in um, a different direction because of my talents. And that kind of leads me to my next, um, I guess, more of a question slash comment. Um, this is a, a very, very busy marketplace. Um, cosmetics, I mean, there's reasons there's aisles and aisles of these things. Not that I understand it, but there's reasons there are. Um, so breaking into that marketplace expensive. Um, so I, I didn't see necessarily that up there uh, from a marketing cost standpoint. Um, and then the next piece is the testing expense um, with the cosmetics. Um, I have never actually a friend that's in this space um, on lip balm and just the testing and the compliance that goes along with that. And I didn't see that up there as well. Um, maybe something you want to explore as you continue to build out the, the financial piece of that because it can get fairly expensive. So really nice presentation. Um, I really enjoyed that. Um, I was especially glad to see how many interviews you did up front. 50 interviews was very good. Um, I'm curious, you, you've got a, a long-term plan on adding to the product line. Um, Again, I'm not the target market for this at all, but it seems to me that, that getting some some strong buy-in on that first product that it is more important than getting to the next product after that. I'm curious how you how you go about getting that. Okay, so I at first I started with my MVP with those three products. Mm -hmm. So then I realized that mm -hmm. it would definitely be more valuable just to start my first product which is why I added them on to my future plans mm -hmm. as they are products that I have found in reading store and products that I have had a lot for. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we go to announce the winners, uh, can we just have one last final round of applause for the start of You know, it's not easy. Uh, they have 36 weeks, give or take, uh, to try to get something to a point where they can, you know, come here and pitch. Um, and it takes, you know, a lot of work. Um, and really one of the things that makes, you know, incubators so unique is that partnership between the business community and the school that happens. Um, and it all really starts with our coaches uh, who are in the classroom with me throughout the entire school year. Um, our coaches, that dedicate three, sometimes four days of coming in and working on things like target markets and uh, their ability to story tell, their financials, website development, you name it. All those elements that obviously make a startup get to where it needs to get to. Um, and, you know, they, establishing that part of their startup is so incredibly important. And I can't say that I can speak from a from a place of knowledge on every single area, as well as they do. Um, it, it really initiates the message that we are entrepreneurs, we are not in a classroom, uh, which is the hardest thing I think in the beginning for me and students to realize is that we are not doing homework. We are building businesses. And if we start thinking like business owners, then you will want to do your homework outside of class, uh, which isn't always necessarily easy for high school students. Uh, but our coaches, they, they make themselves available to students via phone, email, video calls, conferencing. Um, I saw coaches hopping in to answer emails, uh, have 
one-on-one -on -one sessions basically up until yesterday. Um, actually, I saw a little. I saw some work even happening this morning uh, with some of the coaches who had been in earlier this year. So, from the bottom of my heart, thank you, coaches, for for getting getting us to where we need to with our with the content. Uh, our mentors uh, enhance that inc incubator experience by taking on a project with individual with those individual teams. Um, the mentor's job when they step in is to become that third person, that fourth person on a team and really get their hands dirty. So helping students understand, you know, what it takes to start a food truck, to build an app, uh, to, to answer questions, to find people that, you know, they wouldn't be able to find otherwise. So for example, having an interview and, and having an opportunity to meet with a dermatologist. These are things I would not have the kind of contacts or resources to be able to do. Uh, but the mentors step up and say, hey, I'm willing to commit to one to two, sometimes even towards the back end here, probably three to four hours a week, uh, where I can really help the students and, and help advance those business ideas. Uh, and, and, you know, realistically, a lot of our, business, our mentors are business owners where their time is money um, and they do it, you know, free of charge. Um, and they really do, you know, help the students get the resources that they need, but then also keeping them accountable. Um, it's easy to get the senioritis. It's easy to, you know, say, well, I've got sports or I've got this going or I've got that going on. And understanding the kind of tenacity that it takes in order to be an entrepreneur, that you have to be able to balance those things out and you can't sacrifice all of those things for the business. Uh, or make it, I should say, sacrifice all those things and have the business be secondary um, and finding a way to be able to keep it moving forward even as you manage your, your personal life and the things that you do outside of school. Um, the mentors really help with that so much because I can say it over and over in the classroom, uh, but certainly they sometimes need to hear it from someone else. Um, and I, I really do think that um, what we saw here, we were talking about how the pitch is really like, came together since February um, when they did their MVP pitches. Um, a lot of that comes back to the work that the mentors have been doing and the coaches have been doing, working with them to get them to where they need to. Um, so thank you again to the mentors. Um, lastly, but not leastly, um, I do want to take some time to thank my community champs. Um, the community champs are people that the students really don't know about. Uh, they don't really see them in the classroom necessarily unless they pop in. Uh, but our community champs are the people that help me find the people. Um, as you saw, this is a small army of individuals who have to help me every year help these students get to where they need to be. I knew some of these people when I started doing this four years ago, but I can tell you right now, I didn't know most. Um, and where that came from is those conversations like, hey, who do you know that would be great for this? Who do you think would be a great content person for this as a coach? Who do you think would be, make an excellent mentor? And to be honest with you, in four years, uh, the community champs have knocked it out of the park. And every year we run into a situation where, you know, someone's professional life takes them in a new path. Uh, they get a promotion, they take a new position. Uh, someone gets pregnant, someone, you know, has a, a, a personal obligation that makes it that they have to step away from maybe incubator for a year or two. Uh, the community champs come through so many times in helping fill those voids. Um, and, and without them, I, I don't know what I would do in the summer trying to chase down these individuals. Um, so I, you know, I want to say thank you to the community champs for, for making my life easier um, and putting together such an amazing roster of talent to help work with the startups. Um, lastly, uh, you know, a big thank you to Johnsonville obviously for hosting us. Uh, they have been our lead little sponsor now for the last three years. Um, this is not, you know, this is not a class. Um, and they try to stress that from day one. We want to give these students an opportunity to take their dreams and make them a reality. Starting businesses aren't free. You have to have, you have, to have those investments and you need to be able to, to make that happen. And Johnsonville not only provides financial support, but obviously has had us back here the last two years. Uh, Bob and his team have been extremely gracious. Katie spent you know, the whole afternoon with me getting the room ready, trying to get the tech working. 
all those things. May is here tonight as a host. She, she works here as well as being an entrepreneur. Uh, when it comes to the, the support we get from Johnsonville, it's it's almost it's almost to a point of like we don't feel like we're worth more like we deserve it. And it's humble again. We do really appreciate everything Johnsonville did for us again this year. Lastly, but not leastly, before we get to the winners, I do like to point this out. Um, this is me making my sales pitch. If you saw tonight that this was kind of a great experience and you're like, hey, I would be willing to coach, hey, I'd be willing to mentor, hey, come see me. All right, I'd love to get, you, love to, get to know you a little bit. We can talk about things for the upcoming fall year. Uh, if, in addition, you saw something tonight from a business startup standpoint and you are interested, um, and possibly helping those students some, some way, shape, or form, uh, please come see me as well. I can help you make contact with those students if you didn't do so already. Uh, because in, in, in the case of these four entrepreneurs, all, all I have, this, have said distinctly that their plan is to try to move forward. Um, and so whether it's through financial assistance, whether it's a, a resource, a business contact, a mentorship, so on and so forth, I'm sure they would be more than happy to uh, take any any additional assistance you could provide. All right, so let's get to what you wish you were all waiting for. <laughs> Shelly was trying to break in here. Uh, so in the end, it's time to discuss the winners. Um, so tonight, we again um, really see uh, the business community step up. Uh, Adam from Carbolis was so impressed tonight that he is going to make it that we do not award just one startup tonight with investment dollars, but Carbolis will be uh, providing financial assistance and startup investment money for a second team. Uh, so thank you, Adam. This is tough. Um, we had some real conversation in here, and um, it, just like when I did the grading, the first question they asked me this morning or yesterday afternoon or whatever it was, the grades were done. I was like, who was first? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, like literally, there was three points between like first place and you know fourth place. Like they were super duper tight. I'm like it's really going to come down to just how well you can deliver and how much you can put in this last 24 hours to get here. Um, and it's no surprise that we ended up in the same boat, um, really kind of hashing it out between all the startups and really trying to figure out exactly where the best suiting for the, for the investment dollars came. Um, like I said, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's exciting uh, to be able to say that tonight, our winners of investment dollars are keep safes and simply delicious.